Hebrews chapter number 7. We'll begin reading with verse number 4. <clears throat> the title of our lesson is Levi Paid Tithes, but it's actually a lesson on imputation. Levi Paid Tithes out of verse 9. We'll start reading with verse number 4. Now consider how great this man was. Chapter 4 and verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus the Son of God. So we've considered Jesus the great high priest. Now we're going to consider the one who uniquely represented him. The Bible said in verse 3 of chapter 7, made like unto the Son of God. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. For verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as, it, as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were under the were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? The Bible says in verse number 9 of chapter 7 of Hebrews, And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So we see this old that there was before Levi was ever born before Jacob and Leah came together to produce him the Bible considered him as having paid his tithes when Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoil to Melchizedek that Levi the priest of God the family that God set aside to minister to Israel in the priesthood who was to receive tithes from the people for the carrying on of the ministry, yet here he is in the loins of Abraham, hadn't been born yet, hadn't been sired yet, yet he is said to pay tithes inside of his father Abraham. And I begin to think about that, and I begin to consider imputation. What does that what does that mean? In Romans chapter four, verses nine and ten, here is that word impute, imputed listed with a different English word to give you a greater understanding of what it means. Romans four nine Cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith, in the next two words, was reckoned, is the word imputed. Was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Then in verse 10, how was it, leave out the word then, reckoned? Was it reckoned, in verse 10, is the word for Imputed. It was counted in chapter 3 and verse 5 of Romans. Uh, 
But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is That ain't the right verse. Right off the bat, we're doing this. Oh, chapter 4 and verse 3. There you go. For what saith the Scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted. So there was a counting of Levi paying tithes in the loins of Abraham. There was that which Abraham did that was counted as if Levi had done it. It's a very important matter. It's a very important doctrine. In verse 6 of Romans chapter 4, you have the word imputed. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man under whom God imputeth, that is, is he counteth, he reckons righteousness without works. So we begin to see that this is that which is counted for Someone, it's reckoned to them, although Levi was not present. He wasn't, he wasn't born yet. His daddy wasn't born yet. His mama wasn't born yet. But yet it was counted as if Levi, who would be able to receive tithes for God as the priesthood of Israel, he was paying tithes because he was in the loins of Abraham. So we come to understand that this is imputed to him. It was reckoned to him. Romans chapter 8, verse 36. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted. That's to impute or to reckon. We are counted, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. It's as if we were uh, sheep for a slaughter. It is, uh, it is uh, reckoned to us. Now, why are you talking about all this? There are three absolute essential imputations that Christianity stands upon. There are three things that are reckoned either to Christ or to you that is absolutely essential to your salvation. We must first of all understand that God does not save anybody but sinners. To qualify for salvation, we must be a sinner. He came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. But if we go back and study in Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 16, we find that God is speaking to the early parents of humankind concerning their personal sin. So those hereafter, how in the world can we be held accountable and how can it be reckoned to us that we are sinners when it seems like in these verses Genesis 3 16 through 19 that God's speaking to the woman God's speaking to the man God's speaking to the serpent it's their sin and it was they sinned they did it it was their it was it was their problem Genesis 3 16 and unto the woman he that is God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he, God, said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And, to the, and in the sweat of, the, of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So, not that I want to be a sinner, but if I'm going to get saved... Grace is not going to abound except where sin abounds. 
And Jesus Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the th world through him might be saved. saved. So this was their sin. If there is not the doctrine of imputation, taking what Abraham did and imputing it to Levi, he wasn't born, his daddy wasn't born, his mama wasn't born, but the, the, the apostle says it was as if Levi was paying tithes because he would be born of Abraham and this kind of thing, this doctrine he was talking about would pass on to him and it would be as if he had paid tithes who was authorized to receive them, but he had to pay them in the loins of his father Abraham, his grandfather, great-grandfather, whatever. Imputation. It was accounted to him. It was reckoned to him. Genesis 19. <clears throat> Imputation. Genesis 19 and verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, and thy two daughters, which are here, listen to this now, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. They didn't say, the angels didn't say in your iniquity, but you're going to get consumed by being involved with the iniquity of the city. It will be reckoned to you if you stay here. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Verse number 5. Passage of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, graven images, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, listen, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Lot, Ms. Lot, and all the little Lot youngins going to be in trouble because of the iniquity of Sodom. You need to get out of here and separate yourself from them. It was going to be reckoned to them. And here God says, you bow down to idols, I will bring the wrath not only upon you, but upon the children unto the third and fourth generation to them that hate me. So imputation, it's imputed to the children. It would be imputed to Lot and Ms. Lot. Adam and Eve's sin. We are involved in sin because of what they did. We'll see that a little bit further. Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 26. Deuteronomy 3, 26. Moses is talking to Israel. But the Lord was wroth with me, three words. For your sakes. For your sakes. Y'all got me in trouble. The Lord was wroth with me for your sakes, and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. I'm not going to hear it anymore. You're not going into the land of promise. You can get up here on the mountain, look over and see it. Like up on Lookout Mountain, they say you can see how many states? I don't know, ever how many, seven? But anyhow, he got up high and, got, and could look down at it, but he couldn't go in it. But he, here he says, God was wroth with me for your sakes. Well, he was involved in it too. 1 Corinthians 15. There is that influence of sin that spills over, as it were, into others <clears throat> around you. And dear soul, if, if the imputation of original sin 
is not true, then we cannot have the imputation of righteousness. Listen at these verses. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 21. <clears throat> For since by man came death, who do you think that was? Adam, wasn't it? By man came also the resurrection of the dead. Who do you think that is? It's Christ. It's Christ. So man sinned and introduced death into the world. And Jesus Christ died and rose again and introduced life into his elect people. Listen to verse 22. For as in Adam, how many people are in Adam? Every single soul that's ever lived. That's right. That's right. I don't care what nation they are of. I don't care what language they speak, when they lived on earth. Every single human being that's ever lived is going to die. It is appointed. But it was as in Adam. Now, even so in Christ. Now, wait a minute now. How many people are in Christ? Not as many as are in Adam. That's right. If everybody that was in Adam was in Christ, it wouldn't be a hell. Right. If everybody that was in Adam was in Christ, it wouldn't be a broad way. There wouldn't be any tares or bad fish or dogs or sows. So the big circle, everybody that's ever lived is in Adam. But inside that big circle, there are those who are elected in Christ. He says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, even so in the same way, in Christ shall all be made alive. So there is that imputed sin from Adam that brings death, but there is that imputed righteousness from Christ that brings life. Amen. If this is not true, may I ask you a question? What in the world? Does a man dying under Roman rule 2,000 plus years ago have anything to do with you? I'll go one better than that. How in the world does the first man and woman that ever lived in a place that we don't even know exactly where it was, theologians and scholars think that, but anyhow, way back there at the very beginning, what in the world does those people thousands of years ago have to do with you imputation right. one preacher said it like this dogs have dogs cows have cows cats have cats horses have horses and sinners produce sinners I thought well, that's about as good as explanation as I could give the scriptures say, me and you come out of our mother's belly speaking lies. We're sinners. Why? It's imputed to us. And as there is an imputed sin to us, it is established by God that there can be an imputed righteousness to us. What did you do to become a sinner? You were born. It was just imputed to you. You were born a sinner. What did you do to become righteous? Same thing. You were born again. Nothing you did. You wasn't there with Adam and Eve. If I'd have been there, I'd have got a hole out of the shed and chopped that snake's head off. He sure has called us a lot of problems. But I wasn't there. But I got the sin just the same as if that snake had bit me. And it did. So Adam sinned and it came on me. We were in the loins of Adam. Like Levi was in the loins of Abraham. So it says he paid tithes too. But thank God we were elected in Christ from the foundation of the world. And we being in Christ, he has imputed his righteousness to us. So imputation requires, is required for us to 
understand the first doctrine, original sin. Romans chapter 5, and this one right here, you can't separate the two. It's just like water and oil, kind of, you know, well, that really ain't a good example, is it, because they don't mix. Uh, anyhow, it all flows together. It's kind of hard to keep one thing out of the other. It's going to get into my next point. Uh, or rather, really the third point. First point is original sin. How did you get to be a sinner? Imputation. What do you mean? It was reckoned to me from Adam. It, it was accounted to me from Adam. It became mine because of what Adam did and that being in his loins, as it says in Hebrews 7, 9, of Levi concerning Abraham, I became a sinner by being born in Adam. And also become righteous by being born in Christ. All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, what does sin bring? Death by sin. So death, death passed upon how many? All, All men. If you don't believe it, what's the rest of the verse say? For the All have sin. We practice sin. The Bible said this is condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness. Don't be telling me, well, I was a pretty good fella, you know, until I came on a conviction and realized I needed to be saved. You wasn't no pretty good fella. You lied on God and yourself too. You love darkness just like the rest of us. You might as well fess up. This is condemnation, that light has come into the world. Men uh, love darkness. Why? Because their deeds are evil. They want the darkness to cover up their evil deeds. You don't want your mama looking at you when you do what she told you not to do. You want to hide from her. We all sow fig leaves, folks. We got that from Grandpa Adam. So it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. You have to have a thou shalt not to understand sin. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even though the law didn't come to Moses, death was still reigning. You read chapter 5 of Genesis and every one of Adam's posterities, it says, and he died. Every last one of them, and he died. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the likeness or the similarity or the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was a figure of, of that, uh, who is the figure of him that was to come. So as Adam was head of the human race and brought all of those that were born in him into sin. He's a picture of the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the king and Lord over all the spiritual race, and they shall be born again in him. Let's jump on down. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense, that's Adam's, Death reigned by that one man. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You see how it goes together? You have to believe in the imputed sin of Adam and Eve that it's yours. You have to believe that their original sin is mine as much as it is theirs. If you do away with that, you do away with the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Isn't that amazing? That's how God established it. The second great thing that we see is imperative in the Christian faith is not only owning original sin, but secondly, how in the world can you enter into an atonement? 
original sin, imputation. The atonement, again, how in the world did Jesus Christ, bowing his head on the cross, as recorded in John 19.30, say, Father, it is finished. How does the finishing of that sacrifice have a thing to do with you? And why are you here tonight? And why is a Bible in your lap? And why are you concerned about your eternal well-being? Because it takes imputation to enter into the atonement. Isaiah 53 and verse 11. You cannot be saved by works. You can only be or have the atonement made effectual for you by what Jesus Christ did. But how are you going to get it to you? Imputation. God's going to put it to your account. He's going to make sure that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ was by imputation. You being in the loins of Jesus Christ, as it were, Levi being in the loins of Abraham. Isaiah 53 and verse number 11. He, let's get these pronouns right now. He, God the Father, shall see of the travail of his God the Son's, what? Soul. Not his hands, not his feet, not his side, and not his brow. I do not diminish any of that. That's a horrible way to be treated. Somebody nail you up on a piece of wood like you would nail a picture on the wall or something. That's awful. But that's not what the Bible says. We look at, in sympathy to the piercing of the physical man, God was looking at his soul. He, God the Father, shall see of the travail of God the Son's soul, listen, and shall be satisfied. Now, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. How are you going to be made just before God? Jesus Christ is going to have to do it on the cross, and the Holy Spirit is going to have to make application of it. And what it would you read me the rest of verse 11 of Isaiah 53? He shall justify many for. He shall bear their Are y'all out there? I mean, you just come off a of vacation. Surely you got some energy. You ain't wore out, are you? Let's try it again. Isaiah 53 and verse 11. Shall my righteous servant justify many? For he shall bear their wow, you can do it. I'm so proud of you. He shall bear their iniquities. Well, how in the world did he bear my iniquities without imputation? If Adam's sin is not mine, Christ's righteousness can't be mine. If my sin is not Christ's, then Christ's righteousness is not mine. And all of it is by God imputing sin and righteousness from sin from Adam to me, sin from me to Christ. Righteousness imputed from Christ to me. Verse 5 of Isaiah 53. For he was wounded for two words. Our transgressions. Wasn't, wound, wasn't uh, wounded for his own. He was bruised for our the chastisement of our was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way. You finish it. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Laying on him. That's imputation. God took your sin 
and made Christ guilty for it. Before all this modern day soul winning and this lightheartedness came along, the old Christians used to ask people, do you have any interest in the atonement? That's a good question, folks. That opens up the whole concept of Christ atoning for me because my sin was made his. Of course, you can't hardly stand it. You're waiting on me to say 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, right? Okay, I'll scratch that itch for you. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he, God the Father, hath made, legally constituted. Look that word up. Legally constituted. It became his, legally. God placed it upon him. He, God the Father, hath legally constituted Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that's imputation. That's reckoning him to be guilty of our sin. That we, in order that, if you don't have that, you can't have this. In order that we might be legally constituted, the righteousness of whom? God. Wow. You, you can't get the righteousness of God without imputation. Isaiah 64, don't turn to it. It says, our righteousnesses, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Every righteousness you can come up with is a smelly old stinky rag in the sight of God. And for us to be able to have the righteousness of God is unbelievable. But it can't be without Jesus having our guilt imputed to him in order that he might have his righteousness imputed to us. So when we were reading that in the 15th of Corinthians and it talked about Adam was a picture of him that was to come. The way you got to be a sinner was Grandpa Adam fell into sin and you got it. So why did I get it? You hadn't even come out of your mother's womb yet and you was a sinner. You hadn't done anything bad or good to be received or rejected. And you was already a sinner. How'd that happen? Imputation. Because it was the first Adam's sin. It's mine and yours. So He's a picture of him that's to come. But we're going to reverse that thing now because the last Adam is going to take your guilt and become responsible to pay your debt. And his death on the cross causes him and his righteousness to be yours by faith. What in the world does Adam, way back yonder, have anything to do with you, made you a sinner? What in the world does Jesus of Nazareth, 2,000 years ago, dying on a Roman cross? Man, that ain't got nothing to do. We in America, we ain't got nothing to do with Rome. Imputation. Do you have any interest in the atonement? The atonement is yours by imputation in the same way that sin is yours. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul speaks here of an imputation. Oop, wait a minute. I'm on the wrong page. Galatians 3 and verse 13. Christ 
hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, how did he do that? Read me the next phrase. Kind of loud, if you will. He made a curse for us. Boy, I heard that and I didn't even have to turn my hearing aids up. How did Christ redeem you personally? You tell me. I don't want to hear from somebody sitting beside you. I want to know how you were redeemed from the curse of the law. The law said, thou shalt not, and you came out of your mother's womb shouting. You did it. The Bible said, the law said, thou shalt, and you came out of your mother's womb shall not. You're a sinner for you was born. Now how in the world can you be redeemed from the curse of the law? Christ being made a curse, don't say us, for me. Can you say that? How do you think you're going to stand before God one day? Well, I used to do a lot of works after school. I'd go by and cut that lady's grass and wouldn't charge it. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. You're leaving out imputation. And the entirety of the Christian faith is based on imputation. Yes. Original sin, atonement, <clears throat> which is nothing more than substitution. I got kind of angry when I was learning about some of the things of the kings over in England. And when the king was like a young feller, maybe a young adolescent, he'd do something bad. Well, you couldn't whip the king. You couldn't chastise him. They'd get a boy out of the village and, and whip him in front of the king for what the king did. And I just thought, if that stinking king had any uh, sympathy at all in his heart, it, it would break his heart knowing that that boy was having to get beat for what he did. And all of a sudden, the light went on. And the Holy Ghost said, you moron, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords got beat for you for what you did. Man, you can't praise Jesus. You can't be happy in Jesus. You can't adore Him. You can't worship Him. You can't come in His presence with thanksgiving and say, Lord, I'm so thankful. He said, don't be thankful for this, that, and the other, but be thankful that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you've been redeemed by. The greatest blessing you could ever have is knowing that everything you did that should put me and you in hell, Jesus paid for it. He got to whipping for what we did wrong. And how did he get to whipping? Imputation. Substitution. Original sin by imputation. Atonement by imputation. Last thing is righteousness. How are you going to be made righteous? Well, there's a negative way. Psalm 32 Verse 1, Psalm 32, by not having your sins imputed to you. Psalm 32, verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God has never, ever excused, and watch it now, you're going to get mad at me when I say this, or forgiven any sin. 
You said, preacher, we ought to run you off. If you don't believe God's ever forgiven any sin, how in the world people get saved? He forgives the sinner. Somebody had to pay for the sin. That's right. Amen. It didn't get by God. Every sin that you as a believer have ever committed, every sinfulness that me and you are committing right now, and every sin that me and you shall ever commit from now to our death, Jesus had to pay for it. I think about that, and you may think I'm a screwball. Well, you probably do anyhow without this. But anyhow, I think about, you know, the less I sin, the less Jesus had to die for. So I'm going to try to live right for God. I don't think that's dumb. I think that's pretty good thinking. My goodness. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Psalm 130. In verse 3, men have no righteousness. Psalm 130, in verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark or take note of and bring out to where it can be seen and were to account that to us, if thou shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? What's the answer? Nobody would be able to. Right. Psalm 143 and verse 2. Psalm 143 and verse 2. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Now that's a gospel truth. Old B.B. Caldwell used to say, God, God can send you to hell and he can pay you off. The only debt God owes you is hell and he can pay you off anytime he wants to. This old, we, we don't have any hope of standing before God in any righteousness without imputation. Isaiah 45. I want you to know something tonight. You say, well, it's just another message on doctrine. Well, I want you to know something. It was years and years and years in my Christian walk before I ever had it unraveled in my head. Okay, I believe in the blood of the Lamb of God. I believe in the atonement. I believe that Jesus Christ had to die. I believe the Holy Spirit. But I wonder how in the world does just preaching about a Jew dying on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago have a thing to do with me? How does it get to me? I knew Jesus was my Savior. I knew I believed in Him. I knew I had faith in Him alone and that, that if I was going to ever be anything, He would have to do it. But I didn't know how in the heavens did it ever get to me. Preachers wouldn't do what I'm trying to do for you tonight. Explain it to you. Show you how it works. Get the greatness and the majesty of Jesus Christ to come and reside in your heart to show you how in the world Levi can pay tithes in Abraham's loins same way that you got to be a sinner in Adam's loins imputation and you will come to see the imputation will open up to you original sin the atonement and then righteousness one of these days, and we don't know when it will be, you can't get out of it. You can call the dentist and say, gotta cancel my appointment and I gotta reschedule you. But you, you and me ain't gonna get out of this. It is appointed unto us once to die and after that the judgment. It's gonna happen, every last one of you. And don't say, I'm young, it can't happen to me. I've seen caskets this long. I buried a little old girl about that in a box about that big 
Don't tell me it can't happen. It will happen. Now, if you don't get into the presence of God with your own personal God-like righteousness, you're in trouble. And if I was you, I wouldn't want to just keep on believing that same old rhetoric. Jesus died on the cross and now I'm saved. How does it get to you? Well, how does sin get to you to start with? Think. Wake up. Amen. Bestir thyself. Look in the scriptures. Take these, these scriptures down. Get the CD or whatever they call them anymore. It's a little disc with a hole in the middle of it. Get it. Study it. For you. And find out how did God get righteousness into your soul? Because if you ain't perfectly, without a blemish, without a spot, if you have still got one law that you've broken and it ain't covered, you're going to hell. Because breaking one law, he said you break the whole thing. You got to be perfectly righteous. The law requires us to be holy, but it doesn't provide you any holiness. The law requires you to be justified, but it can't justify you. How in the world is it going to happen? Do you care? God let me go through all that turmoil just for you tonight, just to tell you how it works. Isaiah 45, verse 23. I have sworn by myself. This is God talking. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. God did it. Did it on purpose. Words going out of my mouth and I ain't going to let it come back. Your knees going to bow and your tongue will swear and you will say, I have righteousness in the Lord. Even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Dear soul, listen, Jesus ain't just some little figment of your granddaddy's imagination. And that old Baptist preacher up there spitting in that microphone hollering at you like that. God Almighty is in this thing. You don't do business with God by imputation from Christ. You're in trouble because you already have sin imputed to you from Adam. It's already yours. Isn't that amazing? Isaiah 58, verse 8. Then shall thy light, Isaiah 58, 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. God did it. Look at 61 in verse 3. Isaiah 61 in verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. Who planted them? Read me the next phrase and find out. Why did he do it? Read me the last phrase. If you don't get in on imputation of righteousness, you keep God from being glorified. God don't like that. It glorifies God for you to confess yourself a sinner and say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Go in front of him singing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. 
Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I owe everything to Jesus. That's why it says they're going to take their crowns off their heads and cast them at his feet. Because there is nothing good about us except what Jesus Christ is in us. That's it. We are as sinful as Adam. And we can be made as righteous as Jesus Christ. Romans 10, verse 3. You be careful with legal righteousness. Be careful with moral righteousness. Romans 10, 3. For they, Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness. You better not be ignorant of God's righteousness. What does that make you do? Going about to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the fulfillment, the end, the completion of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. God will keep the law perfectly in you by your faith in Jesus Christ. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law like this. The man which doeth these things shall live by them. But... That's the righteousness of the law. You've got to do something. But the righteousness which is of faith talks like this. Don't say in your own heart, who shall ascend up to heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ from death. Listen, it's not that you've got to go get it. But what does the righteousness of faith say? Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man, three words. Believeth unto righteousness. Believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Righteousness can only come from God. You can't have it by the law. The law is like a mirror. You look into it, it don't show you anything but what you are. It just tells you what you are. But looking into the glorious law of liberty and saying, Lord Jesus, I trust you for my righteousness, for my salvation, for my justification. I trust you because I believe that my sin was placed on you, imputation. Therefore, your righteousness can be placed on me. That's the only way anybody ever got to heaven. Listen. Abraham didn't get to have many any other way. But listen, Isaac, uh, the apostle Paul, John, the, uh, the beloved apostle, then nobody in heaven got there except by Jesus Christ's righteousness being placed on them because their sin was placed on him. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, while we're right here in Romans, just turn on over a few pages. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. And here's that word made again. Who of God is made unto us. Wisdom. What's the next one? Righteousness. righteousness. God legally constitutes him to be your righteousness. When you get to heaven, if you stand there and say, look at all the good works I did, he'll, he'll say, go to hell, go straight to hell. Do not collect $200. Do not pass, go. 
Depart from me, you that work with iniquity, I never knew you. But if you stand there and say, nothing in my hand I bring simply to his cross, I cling. Jesus paid it all. He did it. My sin was placed upon him and his righteousness is mine. Enter into the joy of thy salvation. But you can't get it without imputation. Original sin. Why is it yours? Imputation. Adam's sin is mine and yours. The atonement. How did Christ dying on a Roman cross? Like I said, a Jew dying on a Roman cross. Have anything to do with me and you? Imputation. In the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, you don't need to turn there. Paul talks about us dying with Jesus. Being raised together with him. You say, well, I wasn't back there then. You didn't have to be. It's done by imputation. And then that last thing, righteousness. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 6. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved. That is, the king, the branch, the righteous branch in verse 5. And shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called. Now, you may not be able to read it. It's done in tiny, teensy little letters. But do you see it there? The last one, two, three, four words in verse 6. He shall be called what? The Lord our righteousness. I like every word in that. The, the, the nothing else like it. Lord, he is sovereign over everything and everybody. All authority is given me in heaven and in earth. Our glory to God. I like that word. The Lord, he's mine. Is he yours? The Lord, our what? Morality? Mm -mm. Righteousness. Be ye holy as I am holy, the Lord said. You got to be as holy as God is. You say, I can't do that. Right. But if you don't, you're going to hell. You got to be as holy as God is holy. The only way you can do that is by imputation. God hath made him to be sin for us that we might be made as holy as God is holy. The righteousness of God. So you better find out, did Jesus die for your sin? If he didn't die for your sin, then he ain't got no righteousness to give you. And if I was you, I would be sure to check up on that before I put my head on my pillow tonight and say, Lord, I sure do trust that you died for my sin and that you were made to be sin for me because that's the only way I can be made the righteousness of God in you. Ain't God something? Romans 5.18 Brother Gene, can you sum up salvation in one word? Yeah. What word would you pick if you could just say one word? Obedience. You say, man, that sounds like works. If Jesus Christ had not obeyed God, if he had not obeyed him in every thought and in every deed, in every action, in every attitude, we wouldn't have a Savior. Amen. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. 
For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, that's Adam, so by the what of one? There it is. The reason that God is satisfied, which is such a beautiful word, Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The reason he's satisfied when he looked at the travail of his soul, he saw perfect obedience and he gave you perfect righteousness by imputation. Ain't that good? If Jesus died for your sin. Well, you say he died for everybody's sin. Well, go tell them people in hell that. No, I'm talking about you, me, individual, person. If Jesus didn't die for my sin personally, for your sin personally, we don't have any hope of having any personal righteousness. For by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, many were made sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Chapter 8 of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, we love verse 28. And we know, if you don't, you should know, that all things, not all good things, not all pleasant things, but all things work together for good to them that love God. Who are they that love God? Them who are the called according to God's purpose. And then he begins to tell you that his knowledge of you from the foundation of the world caused him to predestinate you to be conformed or, mo or a mo shaped out in the mold of Christ. And he said, whom he did predestinate to be conformed to Christ's image, those he called by the Holy Spirit. And those that he called, them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified friend if I was you I'd get in on that there ain't a wrinkle or a hiccup in that whole thing Amen. if God starts off with you he, you will wind up glorified and if I was you I'd make sure that I found out that I was in that particular vein of God dealing with me so that I would wind up glorified. Because God don't mess around. If he's going to save you, you're going to be glorified. There's no other, there's no doubt about it. There's too much at stake. Justification, just as if I never had sinned. And then glorification made me like unto God. We shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. When Christ shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Oh, my soul. What a marvelous, marvelous thing this is. Jesus became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. And dear soul, it's only done while we're here in Romans. Let's look at 324. Being justified how? Freely. You say, well, I don't have no money. Ho, oh, him that thirsteth come and drink. Without money. Here there's hunger. Come and eat bread without price. You don't need no money. Jesus paid it all. I didn't say he paid some of it. You know, he paid it down. No, he paid it all, honey. Listen, it's done. It's there. All you got to do is claim it, believe in it, trust God for it, 
and know that Jesus took your sin in order that you might take his righteousness. It's done freely. Second Peter 1 Peter 1 is our last scripture, Brother Ed. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and the righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you like to be one of those that the apostle was talking about? In that verse, would you like to make sure that that which Jesus Christ has done would apply to you? It sure would be sad to have to climb over the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross in order to get to hell.